Hi, Maria. Hi. How are you? How are you? I'm very I'm, good. How I'm are so you? I'm so excited today um, to actually talk with you because the Rancha book was something that was going around when I was in college um, in the 70s. And it's something that I was always fascinated about. So um, you've got somebody who's curious <laughs> from one point of view and someone who had this lived experience. So I'm so happy that you're here. Um, Thank Maria. you so much for, for doing this and for having me. Yeah. And I'm excited that you recognize it. A lot of people have not, but I guess in your line of work, um, I appreciate the yeah. experience you've had with that. So, I'm, I'm uh, sure a lot of different experiences. Yeah, it should be interesting. Um, so I know you have a background in education and you're a school teacher. Um, and so you have a lot of insight for young people, but I was interested in why you wrote the book. What was the motivation to write your story? It, it kind of um, morphed, it kind of changed as I was writing it. So uh, it started as I'm, I'm a writer anyway. I just write things down because I'll forget something or um, so I'll, I'll write things as they come to mind so that I can kind of take it out of my brain because my brain will keep spinning through the memory and I'll write it down. And then I had these excerpts that were written down of things that have happened to me or things that have happened um, with my dad. And then um, I, I went from that to writing um, this supernatural story with this character that had these things happening to her. And so it was kind of a process. And as I did that, I also then came across a documentary well, lots of documentaries, but one in particular, that was my aha moment. Um, that was uh, Dateline NBC, and it was called Angels and Demons. And this girl is talking about her step, sort of stepfather, uh, father figure, who was doing the things that my, I recognized my dad doing. And as they were talking, they were talking about, you know, yeah, um, they see angels, uh, things like this, the things that, that I've lived with. And um, I listened to it and they said, do you know what that thing was that you were pulled into? And she said, a cult. And I thought, a cult? And she, and they said, well, you know, did you believe it? And I thought for sure that the girl was going to say, well, of course not. I thought they were crazy. But she floored me and she said what I would have said. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect that. What I would have said was, I felt so privileged to be a part of something so special. That's, that's what a, this that's, girl said. It's an amazing uh, expression because uh, there's a friend of mine who was in the group I was in and he described his group experience as being in a prison of specialness. That makes a lot of sense. It does. And no one else knows as much as you do because of your experience. You know, no one knows as much as we do. We're a privileged family, um, especially because dad is linked in with God. He can, uh, he has messages and communicates with God every day and has miracles that happen with him every day. So when that aha moment happened with that Dateline episode that I watched and listened to. At the moment, I quickly, I had been writing actually that supernatural story. And um, I, I quickly Googled character traits of a cult leader. And I didn't realize who this was at the time or that I was gonna read all, all of his books, but Joe Navarro, who was, is a retired FBI agent profiler had written about um, dangerous personalities. Well, this particular article that, that I pulled up was about character traits of a cult leader. And it could have had, there were 50 things and dad falls under 47 of them. <laughs> it could have had his name at the top other than maybe three or four items. So that was my, I think my big turning point. But the reason for writing the book was that it really was, it must have been therapy. It must, I mean, it was my therapy. 
So who am I gonna go to with something like this or with what I've been through? Who would uh, even understand? I really needed to educate myself. Yeah, so I had to, I mean, it started with that kind of, that Google right there. And uh, so the more I read, the more little various thing pads I went down and I would save all these icons on my desktop so I wouldn't lose them. And I would start making a list. And um, the book, I thought, okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pull out just those pieces that are my story, but I'm gonna call it my grandmother. My grandmother did this, <laughs> my grandmother said that because I was so terrified of um, going against my family, my father, embarrassing us, going against God, betrayal. I was, I'm ab it's absolute betrayal and it's really painful and difficult. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is going to turn a page between my family and I that will never be turned back again, which it's, you know, I had to come to terms with that. I knew that was coming and it's not easy and it never ends. Um, and so each one of these little steps is a big decision. So I finally was able to rewrite that as my father said, rather than my grandmother, because there's nothing more potent, more important. There's no one more, more important in your life than your father who tells you the truth and teaches you life. And I mean, and that was a big scary moment. And I, I have gone through so many um, feelings of shame and guilt and hearing my mother yell at me in my head, what is wrong with you? How could you do this? You know, are you out of your mind? <laughs> just all the things that she would, you know, I could just hear her saying, which is understandable. Uh, but this, this is just, this was something that I absolutely needed to do. So in the book, I hope not to trigger anyone, but I, 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 when I talk about him, I say my father, like God, the father, and I capitalize the M and the F for mm -hmm. my father, like God, God, our father, you know, in whatever prayer you might say, you would capitalize, you know, the pronouns or whatever. So mm -hmm. I just felt like, because there's dad but there's my father who speaks to God and God tells him when people are going to die. Um, he is um, given to know when someone is going to die and when he needs to go and be at their deathbed. He's been at uh, many deathbeds. Um, although no one will know that he was there, the family happened to be out of the room just as he walked in. Um, and then the person, you know, they, exchanged words, the person was waiting for him, they passed away, and then he left without anyone knowing he'd ever left home or that any, anyone in, in the hospital or at the house or whatever, knowing that he had been there. Mm. Um, and there were a lot of those kinds of things. Um, and so the, then the book ended up being, I mean, it started as my, my therapy of, you know, I would go through a little, a, memory and then I would look that up and I would connect it with the research and the books I would read and the comments that you know the quotes that I found and the music lyrics that I found and I would connect the story with those things those are just as important if not more important than anything that's happening in my story okay. the whole reason then for taking this because it was even more terrifying not only to have written this all down and not only to now understand it and go through the ups and downs of you know being upset about it and all but then to say yeah i'm gonna publish it yeah that's gonna be out there but why would you do that mm -hmm. well because maybe my life wouldn't have been maybe there wouldn't be so much time spent on all this research if it were in one place or, and it can't all be in one place, but every time I read someone's memoir, some little spark would hit me and that would be something that I would look up, but then it would be a quote that I would use in my story. So 
being the teacher that I am and the big sister that I am and the mom that I am, I want everyone to have everything readily accessible. And so I can understand, you know, an academic going through this book and saying, oh my gosh, look at all of these quotes. Look at all of these footnotes. Is that really necessary? Yes. Number one, because this isn't written for me. I was, the process of writing it was for me. The product is for the person who's looking for another memoir and then some links to when they make a connection, why do they have to spend the next two weeks going down rabbit holes? Here are the five places I found information about this, if that's, mm. if that's what you see in it. So there are a lot of different things that I could talk about that I've been through and that are in the book um, that are interesting. There are sensationalistic things. Um, there are things that I just went through as a daughter. But those things um, really, it, it depends on what resonates with you and your story. And I'm hoping that people can use it that way. Yes. Um, so uh, what, what's interesting is the, um, um, the experience of someone who joined a group like myself and someone who was born and raised in a group. Um, I think that those experiences have similarities, but there's some big differences. Um, and to some extent, you know, I had volitionally joined a group when I was 17. There might have been manipulation and all those things that um, were associated with that maybe not the truth, but you didn't have any choice in this matter. You were born and raised into this. And so you do have that um, kind of special issue uh, of parents who were still in the group and are still believing or family members who are still believing and you're on the outside. Um, yeah. And so my work often is about trying to bring those people together. And I'm just wondering, I mean, what about the relationship you now have with your family? Is it severed? Is it close together? Is it it's, rocky? It's, it's severed, rocky, strained. I do. I have gone no contact with my father because you have to get to a point where whatever you you know makes you comfortable, or whatever makes you so uncomfortable that you can't bear it. Right. I can't bear. For one thing, I can't bear to be rude to him and tell him to stop talking or stop talking about something. So I can't talk back. I can't tell him to stop or, or anything like that. I can't put myself in that situation. Um, I also can't forgive the things that he's done, not him in particular, because that's a whole other story. But just the things that he's done where he's pulled my son into it as well. And at the time, I... I wasn't aware enough. I thought, well, if he wants a relationship with his grandfather, you know, how could I stop that? Let, you know, if he wants to believe something, how can I get involved in that? But I wasn't as aware. I wasn't aware yet. I hadn't woken up yet, really. Like I was on my way out, but I hadn't recognized the, you know, the depth or what uh, I needed to do. So there are things that he does on purpose, many, many things that he does on purpose that, um, can't be undone. So uh, that that is stressful. It, it's, but um, and it's stressful. So my relationship with my family is is strained. Um, my mom um, told me that if I have no relationship with my dad, then I have none with her. So um, where people, as you were saying, when you when you join a cult or when you join some kind of a group um, and start going down this road and um, you're, you're, you're in it, you might have family who's on the outside saying, hey, when you come out, come home, or I, I've got a place for you. When you do this, basically what you're doing is leaving your family. And that's a really hard decision to make and it's a, it's a very painful thing to do. And it's, it's kind it's of like, you go through that grief and loss over and over again as things happen. You know, it never goes away because there's something new every day that's going on. And, and my father being, you know, and the narcissistic characteristics that he has continue the crises constantly in that family. So where I've stepped off, you know, the merry-go-round, as John Lennon would say, they're still on it, even though they're recognizing it now because I'm warning them and I'm telling them, look at the things that I'm finding and be careful. And, but you know, they've been able to do that balancing act and they're, a they're able to and allowed to talk back and I'm not. 
it just was, I'm the oldest of four. I think everybody is different. Maybe I just don't handle it as well as they do. I give them a lot of credit for being able to handle that and continue in a relationship and still have them, you know, their parents to hug. But but your experience is interesting. There's some research done by the London School of Economics looking at four groups and it looked at people who left uh, groups who were born and raised in them. So these are four specific groups, you know, groups are all different. Um, But in these groups, they found that the the first person that left the system, left the manipulative sort of family system or manipulative group, the first person was really out on their own. They, you know, they sort of had to forge for their own, (laughs) uh, figure out how life works on the outside. There was no real support. Uh, The second cohorts that left, had somebody on the outside who had left, sort of paved the way for them. And then the third level of people who left these particular groups were able to m- maybe flow back and forth a lot easier. So in some way, it sounds like you, you, you created that beachhead on the outside of the system, which allows space for other people to leave. And, and then the way you describe this event of seeing this Dateline uh, show is quite interesting because I know in my own experience and so many people I work with, what helps them see what happened to them or, or reevaluate, start that process, is they see something that's similar, but not the same. And it creates like, oh, I, there's something similar to that. I saw something like that. And then it, in some way, for some people, stimulates their curiosity, and then they want to start searching. And so that search, I know by myself, took years to find that there was no internet, there was hardly anything in books. You put it all together for someone, here it is, and you're creating a, a, you know, making that glide path out so much easier. And that's a really wonderful thing. Thank you, I'm hoping. And and there's a website called cultedchild.com too. And it was a domain name that was available and I thought, you know what, let's just connect it all so that it, it makes sense and people can find it because everything and anything that I, that's in the book or, and more have been put on there, um, you know, like YouTube and everything. But yeah, it's I, always, all of it is, you know, from research, PhD. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not just someone's opinion. It's someone who is, a, is, who is studied and who is, um, you know, a part of that profession, you know. Well, I, I just want to point out that there's 25 pages of resources in your book, uh, hundreds and hundreds of footnotes. Um, so, the, you know, it is a resource for for many people. And I think that it's important for people to realize that a book that's unique about a particular group may have a lot of relevance to people from very, very different groups. Uh, And in my case, I was in a Hindu-based group, and there was something in this Christian group that I heard about that seemed so much similar to what I was involved in. So there's connections we can see sometimes when it's a little bit farther away. So that's it. So, uh, you know, we're talking about this uh, group you're family was raised in you were raised in and i happen to have a copy of the rancho book um it's something that i have a tremendous amount of curiosity about i know that there's a lot of unknowns about when this was actually written uh, no there's not no there's not it's out there yeah (laughs) no i've been hearing the origin story oh since i since i was a kid since i was a baby so i mean and i write about that it hadn't been my original intent to even write about the Arantia book, but you really need to kind of understand how the Arantia book came about to understand how my dad works and why he does some things that he does. So, and, you know, in the book, I, I describe the Arantia book and it's written by celestial beings. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, you're, you're able to quote from it because it was written by celestial beings and not by a human. So there's no law that says you can't quote from it because there's no human to say that that's theirs. But it's in the public domain for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, uh, yeah. Th- so there's this question. I, I mean, I, I when I was doing some research in the past and recently, but it maybe it came about as early as 1924, somewhere around to 1955. Do we have it or do you have any insight into actually who put this text down? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's, 
in the book and okay. uh, not just my information and the stories that I have, but where to go to find those, to find books about it and to find websites about it. Because yeah, it's it absolutely started as a cult from what I understand a cult is, you know? Um, and so there was this special person, there was a sleeping subject, you know, who was channeling this information to this very special select small group to this one particular person. Um, there was five in this group, uh, you know, so, I mean, it started that way and then it opened up to the 70, yeah. so the 70 who really were from 250 people to 400 something estimated, depending on whose book you read and whose, um, article or website you read. Uh, and so, I mean, I call him Dr. P. Nolan, the man who mm -hmm. I believe wrote the book. I think that he wrote, it's like writing, you know, it's like Tolkien or it's like, you know, Game of Thrones. I mean, a song of ice and fire kind of thing. I mean, you can write, there are people who can write 2000 pages that sound pretty good. Yeah. Um, and well, there's a lot of plagiarism in it and, well, these are the these are the things that make me want to read the book <laughs> because I'm curious about the origins. I'm curious about these things because this was floating around when I was in college and at, at my cult university. Um, well, I actually met uh, one of the the remaining five people. Okay. Um, and uh, I was ten, nine, turning ten, and I met her, and uh, I no. call her Sally in the story. But her books are there, and her name is in, you know, the the quote the footnotes that I have, you know. But I just don't want to use other people's names in that way, you know. But she took me by the hand, and she told me how important I was as a second generation Urantia follower. That our generation, we did not walk, you know, just like you know, doubt, doubting Thomas. I mean, we didn't get to walk with Jesus. We didn't get to be there when the Urantia book was coming about and see it take form like this, be there for the channeling session. And we have to go by faith from here on out. So once her generation is gone, our generation is the generation that is most important to carry this forward, the dissemination of the Urantia book forward. And so. That's I mean, a lot of pressure. In nine, itself. And so, <laughs> so your family, when did they get involved? They're just curious. My dad found it in college. In college. And I, I was about three okay. at that time. So since I was a baby, I remember. So, so it's, uh, it's part of his being at this point. Absolutely, yeah. Every, yeah, every moment he'll. So there, there, there's so much, I think that's um, any author, any reader, regardless if you're interested in the Rancher book or, or groups in general, there's so much people can get out of what you've written, uh, this resource. And I was wondering if you have time to take and read a little maybe from your book. Um, so here is the cover. Uh, at the yeah. beginning of the uh, this webinar, we put up uh, some pictures of it. Yeah, you got it. I can't believe that I have this in my hand and it's- Your sorry. first copy in your hand? It's pretty thick, yep. And- uh, It's always exciting. But this is how it started, Just starting to, started as a sticky note, which attached to another sticky oh, wow. note. So one of these is cult leader tactics behaviors. And one is follower symptomology. So this is how it started. I just started jotting things down and then looking things up. So, and then this is what came of it. What came out of it. And how yeah. long was that process from when you first wrote your first note until today? I think those notes started around the time of the um, dateline, which would have been five or six years. Um, but I started not being comfortable and, and being very unhappy um, with my with my father's behavior and with my parents' treatment of my family because mm -hmm. um, probably ten years ago. So that five years of unrest for me and having difficulty, I think, prepped me for. Yeah. You know, final when I when I finally recognized and and was ready to start research. Set the stage. Yes. Yeah. For a future, a different future. And I do have my husband and my children who are my absolute, you know, 
foundation and support. My husband has been with me since we were, I was 15 and he was 16 when we met. So oh. uh, he's lived this whole thing and it's been a roller coaster. And, and, you know, it's funny because I've always said that I would come to him telling him something and he would have to tell me, no, the sky is not green and the grass is not blue. Come here, <laughs> let me show you. See, the grass is green, sky is blue. This is what, you know, this is what is true because my dad could get my thinking so turned around and backwards. And then, and I would come away being able to, you know, verbatim say what he said to me. And then, and my poor boyfriend would go, no, honey, <laughs> you, know, <that's, laughs> you know, but he would do it in such a gentle way that he actually wouldn't even say no. He would just re, you know, he would restate things and he's never said anything negative about my family, my parents, nothing. He's just, he's pretty amazing. But what's funny is my, one of my boys, my middle son designed the cover and it's actually um, the trees upside down. So this is the green. So the sky okay. is green and the grass is blue. And I don't even think he did that on purpose. I think he put it upside down on purpose because the whole thing is just backwards and, and wow. upside down, but it worked so well. And then the culted child, the two C's, when they go together, um, it looks like an adult hugging mm -hmm. a child, yep. you know, with a circle around it. But really it looks like it, it could potentially be the three concentric circles of the Arantia book. No, yep. It's on the cover of your intro book, but it's not because it's C's. Mm. So, anyway. so I, 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 before you uh, take the time to read for us, um, the experience of your husband, I think, is a, an, also an interesting uh, uh, subject. And it, maybe at some point in the future, we could do a uh, talk with him also, because how he handled the experience with you. So great. And, and how did he do the, you know, this sort of razor's edge of how to maintain a relationship and not make someone feel bad and not criticize and show respect and all of those things? How he managed that is a skill set. And that's Absolutely one of the things that we true. teach families how to do. But it would really be interesting to see how, what was his thinking. That would be it for another, another uh, uh, time. That would be great to pick his brains like that. Yeah, it would be. Uh, so, could you give us a reading? Well, instead of reading about, you know, dad channeling Jesus okay. or, um, or even, you know, him being chosen as the one who um, is going to face Satan in, in, um, for man, all of mankind, um, because he was the one who forgave Satan to move us forward into the next epical revelation things like that and rather than even reading the sensational things i thought it might be most helpful for people listening since we're all coming from a similar but different place to hear it as a child you know who's living this because that's probably more um that would probably be closer to their experience so I'm trying to get it i just wanted to read something as um give you an idea of what it's like to just be a kid in this situation. Great. Okay, so as an adult, I watched a Dateline special called Angels and Demons. In the episode, Dennis Murphy asked Emily about her manipulative cult leader. He could see when somebody was going to die. Was that in his powers? Yes, right, she acknowledged. This was also in my father's powers. Going to bed was a terrifying prospect. I dreaded the darkness and what could be in it. As a child, I needed the hall door open for the light to pour in to keep me safe. As an adult, however, all closets and doors in the room must be closed for me to sleep. I've awakened on too many occasions screaming about a dark figure in the doorway. I'm pretty sure I know why. The night after my great grandmother passed away, as I was drifting in and out of a restless sleep, I was probably about 14, I was startled awake by a large figure standing in my bedroom doorway. You know, Dad commented as I blinked at his shadow. Someday there will come a time when no one has to die a natural death. Someday when people are ready to merge with God's spirit and move on to the uh, mansion worlds, they will already know from the voice of God inside them. Death won't even exist anymore. 
the average person will be so attuned to God's voice and so adept at doing his will that they'll know the perfect decision to make at every juncture. He was silent for a long moment, waiting. Uh-huh, I managed to stammer a response. What gift could you ever give God that he hasn't already given you? I shrugged in the darkness, thoughts spinning, trying to think of an impressive answer. God made everything, he answered for me. Anything you could give him, he's the one who made it to begin with, isn't he? I nodded. But when you reach the point where you are able to say, Father, if you were living my life right now, what would you have me do? And then you truly listen for his answer and follow his directions, you are inviting him to experience that unique moment with you. That is a gift only you can give to God. It is the only gift that you can give him. He stepped away from the doorframe and lifted his invisible wand, jabbing it at me with each point he was making. When that level of mastery is reached, in which a person can live his life as God would live it. That's when they are ready to fuse with their thought adjuster. It was not the first time I'd heard this sermon. Dad walked in and sat on the edge of the bed and I scooted over to give him room. Think of it, he continued. There won't be funerals. People will have going to heaven parties. They'll invite friends and family. There will be large numbers of people ready to make the trip at the same time in a large arena, just for those ready to, to fuse. He trailed off in thought. He was absolutely describing the carousel death ritual scene from the 1976 Warner Brothers movie, Logan's Run. In that moment, the thought ran through my mind that this movie seemed to depict a higher truth concept introduced by the Arantia book. Have you ever heard of spontaneous combustion? My father asked me. Upon hearing the term, my mind envisioned envisions the photographs of documented cases of spontaneous combustion that I'd found in library books. A blackened walker is laying on its side in front of a toilet. A thick scattering of black ashes lie beneath. Of course, I had heard of spontaneous combustion from him on multiple occasions. I was certain it would happen to Dad as the method by which he'd depart from this mortal life. Confounded and terrified by the prospect, I'd researched the concept extensively, yet I held respectfully silent. That's what spontaneous combustion is. It is what happens when a person becomes one with his thought adjuster. He pulled on his arm skin to demonstrate, this is just a chemical, electrical, mechanical material body we use. When we fuse, the material body isn't needed any longer. The physical body burns up in the brilliance of fusion. It'll be a natural, accepted, and celebrated part of everyday life. I was thinking of my great-grandmother and my grandparents with confusion, excitement, and caution, not entirely sure I'd want to celebrate something like that. Dad didn't give me a chance to comment, but I have to tell you what happened last night. I was guided to be with great grandma just at the moment she passed away. I took this in stride. Wow, what happened? It's not the first time I've been guided for this purpose. Well, this wasn't the first time I'd heard a deathbed story like this, but dad would tell it as though I'd never, he'd never shared one before. I listened respectfully, absolutely certain of its authenticity. I was told that I was needed. I didn't even know where or for what. At about two in the morning, I got on the highway and drove toward the city and I prayed thy will be done. And that's when I knew who I was visiting. Wow, I said. It was a long trip, but I also knew what exits to take. I got to the hospital and I walked in. No one was at the security desk. He chuckled and repeated, no one. The elevator door opened as I walked up to it. He was breathless with the excitement of the tale. You're the only one I can share this with, he confessed. He could barely contain his thrilled giggles. I didn't even know what floor I was going to. Man, I smiled from ear to ear in wonder. The door opened on the third floor and I stepped off. The automatic doors to the ICU were already open. I just walked in and walked down the hall. Grandma's room number seemed to glow or have a glow around it. Might be more accurate. I was enthralled in dad's adventure. That's amazing. I was with her for a short time. She opened her eyes and reached for me saying my name in Italian like she always did when I was a kid. I prayed with her for a few moments and then she was gone. I could only shake my head in wonder, knowing that no words I could offer would be appropriate or intelligent enough. That's the end of that quote. Well, thank you. That's it's an amazing uh, journey. And, and we have, um,
questions coming in in very different categories. And I don't know where to start first, but so I think I'll just dive in. And there's these questions about your dad and your relationship with your father and how you saw him as sort of your normal dad. And then this God, the father dad, how did you, the question's a little bit ambiguous, but how did you sort of reconcile these two different dads? Was it sort of like a split consciousness? How, how would one describe that? Um, well, you know, it, it depended on what was going on or where we were at the time. If we were alone in the car driving somewhere, no matter where it was, it was preaching time. If we were alone working on something, it was preaching time. But we did a lot of construction around our house, um, in the yard. There was always work to do. There was painting. There was building things, tearing things down, and that kind of thing. So um, always keeping you physically busy and keeping your mind busy. Um, but it depended because then he would do something nice like get me a pony. Um, so he would help with, you know, building a lean-to little shed for the pony and putting up fencing and that kind of thing. And or he'd have it. So that's kind of what it was. It depended on the conversation and the, and and what was happening at the time. Of who, of who you perceived him as, mm -hmm. and and so. Uh, along the line of fathers, um, what's your relationship with him like now? I don't have one with him. No. I know um, I received a letter from him um, that was 13 pages long in a font 10 typed, teeny tiny type, um, telling me he forget, you know, that he found my website, he forgives me, um, and then going on about truth, beauty, and goodness, and telling me some of the same preaching, but then also telling me. I'm not going to talk about this with anyone anymore, but I know that he does. He has said to me he would really like to talk to me. And I don't, I don't have anything to listen to anymore. Okay. I mean, at this point in your life, that's where, where you are. That's where I need to be. Um, so a, a person asked, uh, how much time passed from your realization that, that your father fits sort of the profile of, a, of a, someone who is manipulative? Uh, until you started consciously putting your book together? Probably. Hmm, yeah. Within a six month period, I would say it went from maybe a, you know, just before Christmas to summertime. Um, being a teacher, I was very busy, of course, for second semester, so a lot kept me busy, but I would do this, I would be writing this on the weekend and, and researching and that kind of thing, um, and I wouldn't let that get in the way of my, my students come first, so this was a, like a summer thing or a weekend thing, and so I think it was probably a six, within a six-month period where I would be finding things. One thing that was very potent to me, and I wrote to Jim Moyers, who had a website, has a website, he talked about on his website shattered faith and that i believe was another aha moment that kind of just solidified my feelings about everything um and so i wrote to him and said shattered faith wow that's it where did you get that and uh so i, I mean, that was very helpful so that's probably what it was about a six month period uh, uh then there's a uh... <clears throat> sort of related to this, it's on the other side of the equation. How do your f children feel about you uh, publishing Cult Child, Cult of Child? I uh, asked them what they thought about it. I made sure it was okay. I try not to inundate them with talking about it. Um, you know, at first that's all you can think about and it's all you can question and talk about. And then you have to catch yourself and realize that they are not your therapy session. Mm -hmm. um, and they have been amazingly um, supportive and whatever you need to do, we're fine with this. And um, I think it's, it's helped them too, because it's helped them to put into perspective things that have happened to them because of him. How, how deeply were they involved in? Quite a bit. Oh. Um, the, yeah, the, the oldest was quite a bit. And so that leads your, that leads his younger siblings in a different direction and leads his life into a different direction than he had been going. So, so there's a question about, um, we're talking about uh, uh, beings that are disembodied, spirits, things like that. 
did you or yourself ever have these experiences internally, something people couldn't see, that you would perceive these uh, entities? I always assumed they were listening. I always assumed they were in my head listening and that God was in my head listening because when you read the Urantia book, it tells of times, it, it'll describe the thoughts and actions and conditions and feelings of Mary and Joseph, mm -hmm. of Thomas, you know, of... So if they know that, they certainly know. I mean, if they could write out specifically what the person was thinking and why and what held them back from doing something in particular, that's the way that the Urantia book describes people in, within their own mind. Mm -hmm. So they certainly know what I'm thinking and doing at all times. So I, I never saw anything. I assumed they were there and listening. So I was always talking to them and I was always trying to be mindful that they were there. Um, I felt very stupid that I never could figure this out. Um, and mm -hmm. the other part of it though, is when you're listening for the highest concept of truth, beauty, and goodness in your mind, really what you do is doing is in this situation for this particular person, what would be the kindest thing I could do for them? Well, the kindest thing I could do for them would be to drop everything I'm doing right now and to take mm -hmm. care of their needs. And that can destroy your life. Yep. If there's no guidance from a parent or a grandfather in helping you to know how to take care of yourself and how to make those decisions yourself, and if whatever the beautiful, most beautiful thought is, is to take care of somebody else and drop everything you are supposed to be doing, that, that's a very destructive situation to be in. And then when you recognize that wasn't even God telling me that, there was nobody there. That's the shattered faith. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you think that uh, the person in the role of someone that was a, a member, maybe your dad, uh, that they experienced uh, these things? I think people thought that they did. I think, yeah, there are a lot of different people. We had a woman who would do automatic writing. Okay. And with that automatic writing, um, it would correspond with the things that he was channeling at the time from Michael of Nebadon, who we know as Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there were people who felt they were seeing and hearing things or saying that they did. There's a long tradition of that automatic writing, especially with the spiritualist and England and Madame Blavatsky. Interesting uh -huh. that, that they had that approach. So a person says, uh, in the evangelical fundamentalist uh, world that I grew up in, demons were a constant fear, lurking behind every corner and inside every Metallica album. Well, that's probably true. Was, there, <laughs> was this the case with your upbringing? Were evil spirits a big part of that world? Or how would you explain, describe the fear of the dark closet doors that you uh, mentioned growing up? Well, for one thing, there's always someone watching. So that's pretty scary when you're eight. Um, and so where are they? Uh, another thing is that I had such incredible nightmares because I have such a vivid imagination that I, I still have incredible nightmares. So that was another reason that I dreaded nighttime too and dreaded what could be in the dark because I had a very vivid imagination and I could I couldn't think that I could make things out in the darkness, which aren't, weren't actually there. But as a kid, I thought I was seeing things. Uh, but I think, but no, that was kind of a, everything in the Urantia book is pretty much positive, but I did ask my dad one time, um, you know, if we're moving on, if, you know, one of the evil angels is on like a detention world and another if satan is still here on earth but not doing anything you know there are still unseen friends here who could follow satan at any moment right like they could decide to start that all over again and he was his answer was pretty much well we all have our own free will and i guess they could so there was an underlying, yeah, that could always happen. There could always be something that could go bad again, like had happened, you know, when Satan fell as an angel. I mean, I'm just interested. Um, this is my own curiosity from, we have this view of, from the fundamentalist uh, gentleman talking about uh, um, the evil spirits and you feeling that there's someone always watching you. 
I'm, I was going to raise an Irish Catholic family, and we were granted a guardian angel <laughs> who was always there to protect us. And I'm just wondering if there was subjectively or how you viewed it, would it be different the way you viewed the people who are watching you from the rancher world compared to like a little Catholic kid who thinks that there's this protector there, always there well, to save me? Well, dad did tell me, I mean, and in the Arantia book, he tells you that uh, children have, I believe, um, two guard, a guardian angel per 100 children. It's either one or two per 100 children um, until they get older and become specialized or, you know, closer with their thought adjuster. And then eventually when you're close to even fusion or when you're really you know, when you're close to there, then you have your own guardian angel. And he was pretty sure our family had our own guardian angel because of our, our special um, knowledge that we had and connection with God. Um, so, but somehow that didn't translate to, I have somebody watching over me. I never felt like I was. You didn't feel that way. No, no. So now we, we've got some questions about your process of writing. Again, I, I know that we talked about uh, how you started with those pieces of paper, but uh, someone was asking about, did you have problems at all with sort of disjointed thinking and how did you go about organizing? And I think maybe we talked, you talked a little bit about that. Yeah, it is disjointed. It's, abs it's so normal, I guess, for me. Um, for me, my, my experience has been disjointed. I remember things in, in scenes. And what I have found was that as I was writing a scene and just writing down what I remember of it, mm -hmm. I realize who else was in the sitting right there because I'm writing it and seeing it again. And somehow, I don't know if that's like hip, what hypnosis does for people. I've never been hypnotized, but somehow it fleshed it out for me enough to remember, oh, that's right. Um, you know, this person was there and I was actually saying this for their benefit. And I didn't accept that dad reacted in such a scary way that the little piece that I remember at this moment is him coming after me. But as I'm writing about it, I'm remembering why I said what I said, because I was kind of thinking about this other person who was sitting there and I was kind of trying to help them out. So it is disjointed. It's, it's little snippets of things because that is what my memory is like, because my memory is really um, just in pieces like that. Everybody's got a different process of writing, and you're, what you describe is how I write. I write little snippets of things, and then somehow try to make a whole. Lot try of to pieces. string them together and see yeah. where they make the most sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, someone asked, "How did the process of writing this book change you?" It brought me um, from a deep depression, sitting on the couch, watching, you know, Forty Eight Hours, Dateline. NBC, you know, 48 hours on ID and just these, uh, th these kinds of shows that kind of have um, a routine to them. Um, so it, it, it brought me out of sitting there depressed for a summer where I really, like, I didn't know where to, where to go. But as I would think of something, I'd start writing it down. And I remember, because my oldest is a writer, and he's, he's a lover of classic horror. Um, I remember telling him, someday you're gonna have to write my story because I wouldn't know where to begin. Mm -hmm. But it really just came from, I need to write this down because my brain needs to take a break from it. And if I, maybe if I write it down, it'll give my brain a break. It, my brain won't feel like I have to remember this. And that would lead to me remembering something else that I would write down or look up and that kind of thing. So when I got busy with that, it got me off that couch and it got me, it gave me a focus. It gave me um, something else. So I would wake up in the morning with all of a sudden thoughts going through my mind. I have to get up and go and write these things down uh, to make sure I don't lose these ideas that I want to look up or that, or just sentences that I want to say, oh, that's, I, you know, where I would remember something and I'd have to just go start writing about it. And, uh, you know, I was just saying to my husband last night that what has happened with this is that I went from that to 
Um, you know, like a writer, they say, you know, Stephen King says you're, you're never done. There's always something else you could change, fix, add, whatever. But Paul McCartney says, there are some things that are just, it's okay, let it go, forge ahead. And I, I love his positive, forge ahead. Um, and I feel satiated, you know, when you're hungry and, you, and you're at a buffet, you know, eventually you're full and you could go back for one more bite, but you really don't need to. So I feel like, you know, yeah, I just found something else that's new, but that's all right. It doesn't have to be a part of it. I don't have to put it in the book. It's okay. So it takes that process of give yourself the time, give yourself the chance to look things up and to write things down and to keep on going because your mind, it's a very slow process. It's like peeling back the very thin layers of a very young onion, thick onion. Um, and you need the time to process that because on the one hand, your brain is trying to protect you from those things. On the other hand, there are thoughts that will pop into your head that are upsetting because your brain wants you to reconcile with it. And if you allow yourself to go through that process or when I did, I felt like those two things came together. Um, I am by no means out of the woods, but I am in transition because I, I have gotten to a place where I feel like, okay, I've, I've done enough with this and I want to, and really the book is not for somebody, like I said, is, is not for me. Now it's to, oh, now I know what I can do with this. I can, it can just be another voice, like the voices that helped me, um, you know, the, the other people that I read, um, just do you think memoirs that, if, that I've read. Do you think that if you wrote this book uh, 20 years ago, um, it would be, a, and left then, you'd be a different book? I mean, you you have children, they're raised, you're, you're accomplished in your field. Do you have a different, do you think you have a different perspective now than you would have had 20 years ago? Just the regrets. I, I really would because, you know, looking back on it, you, you can't, you know, what if, the what ifs, what if I knew? What if I knew? What, what would have been different? What could we have avoided? Um, so that, um, yeah, that would, that would have been different because I don't know what life would be like. I kind of feel like I'm living in an alternate universe from what <laughs> we thought we were going to be living in or yeah. doing. I certainly didn't see myself here yeah. <laughs> doing this. Well, you know, you've, you've taken this, uh, this journey in both being immersed in the, these teachings and the perspective on the outside and shared it with other people. And I, I, I think it's amazing what I, I have the Arantia book, <laughs> the 2000 page book and uh, or more. And there's been questions coming in around, around sort of the doctrines. And I was hoping maybe we could take another opportunity, not today, because we're out of time and maybe talk about the theology or the belief system um, because I'd there's like questions to... about thought adjusters and different things that it would be interesting to have a discussion about. Um, and maybe okay. next month or, uh, you know, sometime in the close near future. I'd love can... to do that. So I'd like to invite Ron Burks. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, he's here someplace. And I'd like to thank him. Mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you turn on your video too, Ron? Um, well, it's uh, not sure I can do that. Let's okay. see. Okay, no problem. No problem. But we can hear you. So Ron was one of the first okay. people to deal with me when I was working on this and looking for looking for someone to talk to about it. And I have trust issues and I have <laughs> abandonment issues. And if I feel like you haven't written back to me very quickly, I have to, you know, now I'm learning. That's just a part of this whole, this whole situation, this whole experience, you know, okay, calm down. They don't have to write back to you today. It's okay. Uh, so, I mean, he's, he's, he's known me for a bit. And, but I, I just wanna say how much I appreciate him being there for me and for all this time. And also uh, just his contribution to being a part of this project has made it 
really something special. Well, I think we can all thank Ron uh, for all the work that How he's done in he helping done. people uh, in all kinds of situations. 30 years of, yep. 30 years worth. Um, he's so certainly fortunate. Yeah, as someone who tries to help bring people together, families together when they're separated by groups, uh, I certainly rely on him uh, to, for his insight. Um, so we got to thank him also. Yeah. So um, maybe you could hold up your book. The website is cultedchild.com. Um, I put it in the chat. Uh, so cultedchild.com. Uh, you could also go on your Facebook page. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a Culted uh, Child uh, Facebook page. Yep. And let's plan another time where we can get together, maybe and focus on the theology or and the ideas, the beliefs around this book. Because I know so many people who have read this, not read this because it's 2,000 pages, but so read skimmed it. through it. <laughs> so it'd be great to have some insight into that. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. It's been a much. pleasure.